Singing in the Rain is considered by many to be the high point of movie musicals from Hollywood's golden age. It features some of the best songs and dance sequences of any musical of all time, and its popularity has endured well after many other musicals from this era have faded away. Even those people who don't like musicals are surely aware of this movie and have at least a passing familiarity with either some of its songs, most likely the iconic title number, or perhaps its portrayal of the difficulties of making early sound films in Hollywood. But is it really deserving of all this praise? Is it really as good as it is made out to be? Yes. Yes, it is. Welcome to my Singing in the Rain review. Now, before we get into really analyzing the movie, let's do a quick recap for those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of seeing this film. Again, spoiler alert, if that's really necessary for these older movies. So, Singing in the Rain starts at a movie premiere in 1927. Arriving at the premiere are famous Hollywood personalities, their fans, and the stars of this particular film, The Royal Rascal. Don Lockwood, played by Gene Kelly, arrives with his co-star, Lena Lamont, played by Gene Hagen. Accompanying them is Don's friend, Cosmo Brown, played by Donald O'Connor. Before they go into the movie, they are stopped by an announcer who asks about their personal story and how they got here. Don Lockwood gives an overview of his and Cosmo's history in performing, and we see a montage with Don's narration over it. The account he gives is a bit at odds with the story we see playing out, but essentially we learn how Don Lockwood ended up going from a vaudeville song and dance man, to stunt man, to leading man. After the exposition, they all head in to watch the film. After the movie's over, we hear Don's co-star Lena speak for the first time. She's mad that she's never given the opportunity to speak to the public, but the reason why is apparent in her voice. She also seems to believe the tabloid rumors that she and Don are romantically involved, which he vehemently denies. After all this, they head off to an after-party. But as they're driving there, the car gets a flat and Don is mobbed by fans. He escapes by climbing onto a streetcar and then jumping into another car. The lady whose car he has jumped into is understandably terrified, but then realizes who he is. He tries putting the moves on the woman, named Kathy Selden and played by Debbie Reynolds, but to shut him down, she talks about how silent film stars aren't that great and that she is a performer on the legitimate stage. Then she drops him off at home. Later, at the after party, they're introduced to a new technology, that of talking films. After this, a group of girls comes out with a cake and to sing a song. Then, out of the cake pops Kathy Selden. She's embarrassed that Don has found out her acting prospects are not quite what she made them out to be, and leaves, after accidentally throwing some cake in Lena's face. Don is depressed for a while because he actually really liked Kathy and doesn't know where to find her. Fortunately, Cosmo comes to the rescue after finding her performing in some musical segment for their studio. Then, Don and Kathy meet up again, and she admits to actually being a big fan of his, while he sings of his love for her. Meanwhile, the jazz singer, the actual real-world first talking film, has been released, and it becomes apparent that sound is the way forward. Don and Lena's next film, The Dueling Cavalier, is turned into a talkie as well. But this poses a bit of a problem, as Lena's voice is not really considered ideal for a talking picture. They try to solve it by taking diction lessons, but there are a number of other problems, such as microphone issues and old habits regarding improvising. Because of all these issues, plus technology problems, the first preview for the film is a disaster. Then Cosmo again saves the day by suggesting they turn the Dueling Cavalier into a musical, call it the Dancing Cavalier, and get around Lena's voice by dubbing her with Kathy. After they come up with this idea, Don drives Kathy home, and then walks back home through the rain, and that's where we find the iconic title number. Don and Cosmo pitch the idea to the studio head, RF, who agrees but tells them not to tell Lena what they're doing. But Lena finds out she's being dubbed, and that Kathy is going to get a screen credit and a big publicity buildup. She also learns that Don and Kathy are in love and are planning to get married. So she threatens to sue the studio unless they keep her the star by making Kathy dub her but never get any credit. Because of a clause in her contract, RF has to reluctantly agree. The premiere of The Dancing Cavalier is a big success, and after the film is over, Lena decides to talk to the audience herself. The audience is puzzled by her different voice and asks her to sing. So she does, but with Kathy standing behind the curtain and singing for her. But as she's doing this, Don, Cosmo, and RF lift the curtain to reveal that Kathy is really the one singing. Lena runs off humiliated, and Kathy tries to run away too, also embarrassed, but she's stopped as Don announces that she's the real star of the film. It's a happily ever after as the film ends with Kathy and Don kissing in front of a billboard for their new film, Singing in the Rain. And that's pretty much the movie. So, what are the high points of this film? Why is it considered such a good movie? And are there any missteps? Well, let's start by talking about the music. Almost all of the songs in this film were pre-existing songs written a couple of decades earlier by Arthur Freed and Nacio Herb Brown. In fact, the entire concept of the film was built around these songs. 
Arthur Freed, who by the 50s had graduated from a simple lyricist to the producer of MGM's most popular musicals, decided to make a musical utilizing many of these old songs he had written. So he got the popular writing team of Betty Comden and Adolph Green to write the script, and it was their idea to set the film in the era in which many of these songs were first written. Now, this wasn't necessarily a new idea. There had been other musicals which were based on old songs and set in the era in which those songs originated, such as For Me and My Gal, also starring Gene Kelly, and Two Weeks with Love, also starring Debbie Reynolds. In fact, this type of musical is one of my personal favorites because it brings back older, forgotten songs, updates them with new arrangements, and sets it within a story that fits the songs perfectly. And that is exactly what Singing in the Rain does, and does so well. All the old songs have been given updated arrangements and choreography and fit the story perfectly. Take the title song, for example. Here's the way it sounded in its first film appearance. I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. What a glorious feeling, I'm happy again. Not quite the same as the one we know and love from this film, is it? The version in Singing in the Rain has a great full orchestrated arrangement and is set to an expertly choreographed and performed dance by Gene Kelly. And this number also fits the story perfectly. It captures the happiness Don Lockwood feels at this moment as everything is going just right for him and in spite of the inclement weather. Now, there are a couple of songs that aren't from the 20s or 30s, such as Moses Supposes and Make Him Laugh. The latter song was actually essentially plagiarized from a Cole Porter song, Be a Clown, which was featured in the 1948 film The Pirate, also starring Gene Kelly. But regardless, these songs, as well as the other older ones, work really well. They each fit the story well, are well presented with good arrangements and choreography, and are also either a lot of fun or touching and beautiful. Take Make Em Laugh, for example. It is a really fun and funny song. This part, where Donald O'Connor does a routine with a dummy, always makes me laugh, and the backflips he does off the wall at the end are just super cool. But on the more serious side, take You Were Meant For Me. It is an absolutely gorgeous song which carries this scene, which is set in a totally empty soundstage. There's nothing else but the song, lighting, and choreography which conveys the emotions of this scene, as Don Lockwood confesses his love for Kathy Selden. So overall, the songs and the way they are arranged, performed, and choreographed are among the film's highlights. But that doesn't mean that every song and dance works perfectly. We'll look at a few examples that aren't quite as good in a bit. But before we do, let's take a look at the plot of the film. The story can be basically broken down into three main subplots. There's the love story between Don and Kathy, the story of Don's professional prospects as the new form of film takes over, and the story of Lena and her place in both the new era of film and in her relationship with Don Lockwood. One of the good points of this film is that it balances these three main stories so well. The love story between Don and Kathy is sentimental and touching, and nicely buoyed up by beautiful songs, but it's not the whole story. He falls in love and loses the girl at the beginning, but has found her and established a relationship before the midpoint of the film. And the stereotypical third-act conflict found in many similar films is greatly reduced in this film, only really lasting a few minutes at the very end. It's also not really contrived like in other films, but serves to move the plot forward in the final minutes to create the necessary comeuppance for the villain in the film, Lena. The love story is also perfectly balanced with the story about Don's place in the film industry and the prospects of his first talkie. This idea of the new style of film and its potential for trouble is introduced early in the film and comes to a head just as Don's love life has reached a happy note. And so it becomes the new focus of the film and creates the next conflict that must be resolved. And Lena's subplot ties in perfectly with both of these other two, as she vies for Don's affection, meddles to stop his new romance, and negatively affects the prospects of the upcoming picture. The three storylines converge and resolve perfectly at the end, as the new film is released and is a big hit, Lena's awful voice and necessary dubbing is revealed, and Kathy and Don resolve their minor, final conflict and live happily ever after. The story also benefits from its humor. This movie is really funny. Lena's voice is excellent, Cosmo's physical comedy is superb, and the jokes almost all land. No, 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 don't go. Now that I know where you live, I'd like to see you home. On top of all the individual elements of comedy, the concept of the entire story is funny. The idea that one of the most successful silent stars has a voice so unsuited to talkies and the resulting scenario is a legitimately funny concept. And one of the final elements that makes this movie so good is its actors. Of course, Gene Kelly is superb in both dancing and singing here, but he also manages the comedy and the dramatic parts well too. He also helped choreograph the musical numbers, contributing to their excellence and success. Debbie Reynolds is good too. Despite being only 20 years old and 20 years younger than Gene Kelly here, she really carries her part opposite him and seems to be mature beyond her years. 
Behind the scenes, she also put in so much work into learning to keep up with Gene Kelly and Donald O'Connor in the dances, and it certainly shows on screen. Jean Hagen is also great with her outrageous voice and mannerisms. But my favorite actor in this film is Donald O'Connor. His dancing is spectacular, showcasing his great skill, but also physicality, humor, and inventiveness. His comic timing is also excellent, and he really contributes to the film's humor as well. Overall, the movie is well-written, well-acted, funny, romantic, and showcases great songs and dance numbers. So, are there any missteps? Anything that doesn't quite work well? Well, I think there are a few. They're not necessarily important enough to impact the overall perception of the film, but let's cover them nonetheless, and we can see if this excellent movie could have been even more excellent. Let's start first with the music. As I mentioned, most of the songs fit the story well, and are enjoyable to watch and fun to listen to. However, there are a few that aren't quite as good as some of the others. The Beautiful Girl montage, for example, is a bit of a break from the main plot, and disrupts the story and pacing. It's only four minutes long, but it feels longer. The couple of song segments we hear at the beginning of this scene aren't great, and the whole thing goes on for just a bit too long. I think one of the reasons it's here is for comedy, as we see outrageous old outfits, but I don't think it's quite as funny as it was supposed to be, or as many of the rest of the jokes are. I think the only other reason it's here was so Cosmo can find Kathy, but I think that could have been accomplished with a slightly shorter segment or one with a couple of better songs. The other musical number that I feel isn't quite as good is the Broadway melody segment. There is great dancing in this segment, for sure. The dances with Gene Kelly and Sid Sharice are excellent and beautiful. But again, this segment disrupts the movie's flow a bit and takes you out of the main story for too long. This segment is 13 minutes long. That's over 10% of the movie's total length. And the only real justification we get for it, besides the opportunity to see Gene Kelly doing some more awesome dancing, is for this little joke after the segment. That's the idea of the number, RF. What do you think of it? I can't quite visualize it. I'll have to see it on film first. I think this segment maybe could have been replaced with something a little more germane to the plot. Perhaps a segment where we actually see Gene Kelly as the modern hoofer, and the dance he does with Sid Charisse is the show he's doing before he goes backstage and gets hit on the head with a sandbag. The last issue with the music I have regards two songs that were cut from the final version of the film. The first is a reprise of All I Do Is Dream Of You. This song is first sung by Kathy and the other girls at the after party at the beginning of the film. Instead of being presented in the traditional slow ballad style, it is an upbeat flapper version, and it's a lot of fun. But originally, Gene Kelly was supposed to reprise it shortly thereafter, when he's sad that he can't find her. Ultimately, this was cut and the footage lost, though the audio does survive. I really think the fact that they cut this was a mistake. It is always nice to have a reprise of an earlier song, especially when they've changed it up a bit, so it's not just a simple repeat of what was heard before. I'm not sure if it was cut due to time, or the fact that maybe it was heard too soon after the first time you hear it, but I think it would have been nice to hear a reprise of this fun song in its more original style. Another song that was cut is You Are My Lucky Star, sung by Demi Reynolds. This is a bit of an odd case, because while they ultimately cut this number, the reprise of this song still exists in the film. At the very end, Don sings this song to Kathy as he professes his love for her. Again. Now, I don't necessarily think they should have left in Debbie Reynolds' solo version earlier. That one is a little odd in and of itself, since she mentions during the song that she was president of the Don Lockwood fan club, which is totally at odds with her not recognizing him at the beginning of the movie. But it is odd that there's a reprise to a song that doesn't exist. Maybe he could have just reprised You Were Meant For Me. Or, since they cut the other reprise of All I Do Is Dream Of You, maybe they could have done it here. Of course, I'm sure this scene was already filmed when they decided to cut the first instance of the song, so that wouldn't really have worked. Regardless, this reprise that isn't really a reprise is just a bit of a misstep. The only other issues which might bring down this film for some are perhaps a couple of historical inaccuracies. The entire idea behind getting around Lena's awful voice is to dub her, but in reality, the technology to do this didn't actually exist this early. I also read an article once which bemoaned the fact that the way this movie portrays the transition to sound was totally inaccurate, and no silent star was ever as unsuited to sound as Lena, and the movie is responsible for perpetuating, or perhaps even starting, this whole myth about silent stars that couldn't make it in talkies. I don't really think this is a huge issue. Even if this film does exaggerate the reality a bit, it's obviously just done for fun. And I don't think a movie should be responsible for portraying history 100% accurately, unless it's a documentary. I mean, if it did, nobody would ever dance or sing. The only other issue with this movie I can think of is this kind of funny cut here. As Moses supposes, he stows us to be. Anyways, that's about it. I think this movie's praise is extremely well-deserved. It combines great songs and dances, a well-written plot, skilled actors, and genuine humor into a masterclass of a movie musical. 
And while there are a few issues which detract a bit from the film, they're pretty minor and easy to overlook, and I don't think they really impact the movie too much. So, do you agree with me, or do you think it's not as good as everyone says? Let me know in the comments what you think and why. Thanks for watching.